All right. Uh, so yeah, intro to information theory. Um, this is a topic that I've been interested in a while, uh, just because I've read so much online about how information theory is like foundational to our modern world and like that sort of thing. Um, and I, I knew the word for a while, but I didn't really know what it was about. Uh, so a couple weeks ago, me and Varun decided to dig into the paper and actually figure out what this this whole thing is. Uh, so one thing I learned is that there are a lot of different kinds of information theory. There's uh, information theoretic statistics, there's quantum information theory, there's neural information theory. All these different fields have different goals and some of them even make slightly different assumptions. Uh, what connects them all though is a certain perspective, a perspective of looking at things in terms of information. <laughs> and uh, this perspective was created by a man named Claude Shannon uh, in order to solve a very particular problem. Uh, that's the problem of communicating over, communicating digitally over, over channels. A channel being like a, a telephone wire or radio. So we're actually going to start off from that perspective and work our way up to the ideas, learning them in that framework. And once we've done that, we're just going to like look at different applications, uh, seeing how this idea that Claude Shannon developed for this specific thing, it actually applies to like almost anything you can think of. All right. So information theory, as I just said, it was created by Claude Shannon to understand what an optimal encoding is for, for sequential data. So sequential data is data that is marked by something like time, right? You have time moves in a sequence. You can have data that moves in a sequence. It doesn't necessarily have to be sequenced by time, but it's important that this is some kind of like ordered data. Uh, it is foundational for digital data transmission, so the internet basically. Uh, compression, any sort of compression that you would do on files is what I'm talking about. Like, uh, I don't know, what's the form of compression? Uh, is FLAC, is, is FLAC? FLAC is compressed, right? Uh, zip files are compression. So that sort of thing is what I'm talking about. And like I was saying before, it has found a wide application outside of information technology. Uh, so yeah, we're, we're going to start off with that basic idea that Claude Shannon had. And this is basically what he was trying to figure out. So if we have an information source, uh, something producing some kind of data, how do we encode that data and then transmit it over a, uh, over a channel? I'm going to move here for the video over a channel. Uh, so this channel, it could be a nice channel without any noise, or it could be a noisy channel. So how do we transmit this message over data to a receiver, decode that message, and get like the nice result? Uh, so you can think of it like a concrete example would be when you send radio signals through the air, that introduces static, right? That's an example of a noisy channel. So if you want to keep your information, if you want to transmit your information accurate, accurately, how do you encode it such that even if that noise is introduced when it's picked up on like the other side of the world, uh, how, do you, how do you make sure that you, you get the accurate message so that, you know, you can actually read what the original message was. And it's not only how do you encode it 
in a in a good way, but also how do you encode it in an in efficient way? Uh, so that's like efficiency would be like how do you make the message short enough uh, so that you can send it over fast? Is what I mean by that. All right. So basically, this this theory is all about codes encoding some kind of data into some collection of symbols such that when you send those symbols over the channel, you can get your data back. Uh, and these are just the components of that encoding scheme. So you can have data, for example, like a book. Let's say your book is the data. Then you have an alphabet. The alphabet is not the alphabet that your book is written in. What I mean by an alphabet is you have a collection of symbols that you want to encode your data in. So this Morse code, the alphabet, there's two parts. There's these dashes and there's dots, okay? Uh, in binary, the alphabets are zero and one. Uh, so those are the two symbols that can go into any kind of binary representation of something, right? So that's what I mean by alphabet. And then for a, for a code that doesn't have any, any loss, you're going to have an injective function from subsets of your data to combination of letters in your alphabet. So what do I mean by injective? Injective means that if you have two different subsets of your data, so like n is a subset of your book, right? There's going to be some n's occurring somewhere in that data. This is going to this symbol. And if your encoding scheme is injective, you're never going to have another thing that goes to this same combination of symbols. Um, so n and o, because those are different, they're going to two different combinations of symbols. What that means is that if you get this one, you know exactly, OK, this means n. If you had n and o going to this same combination of symbols, then if you were looking at this, you wouldn't know how to decode it. You wouldn't know how to get n or o back. So that's, that's the injective function. Um, do we have any questions on that? Now, we have these combinations of letters in our alphabet. I'm just going to call them words, because combinations of letters, words, it makes sense, right? I don't know if there's like a standard way of calling these things, but I'm calling them words. So from now on, for the rest of this, uh, for the rest of this presentation, whenever I say word, I really mean a combination of letters in your, in your code alphabet, OK? So the question is, if we're looking at a specific word, how much information does it contain? Uh, the first thing we have to do is to figure out how to quantify information, uh, which means we need units. The bit is an example of a certain type of unit of information. Um, you guys are all familiar with the term bit, right? So a bit is a zero or a one. Um, so when you're looking at words like these, if your word is just one letter long, that contains one bit. Uh, so zero is one bit, one contains one bit of information. If you're looking at words that are two letters long, those contain two bits. If you're looking at words that are three letters long, that's three bits. And now, bits is just one unit. Uh, the way that we calculate the bits in this binary alphabet, basically, is we take the amount of words that we could represent with in that specific length 
So the number of possible words of a particular length, then we take the log base two of it. And how this works is every time we add another letter to our word, we increase the uh, possible words exponentially, right? If you're thinking of it in terms of combinatorics, if you have, uh, let's say, let's say we're talking in base two again, you can represent two things or two to the one things with one letter. With two letters, you can represent two to the two things, right? That's four things right here. With three letters, you can represent two to the three things. So when we take the log base two, we're just sort of increasing uh, the, our number linearly instead of exponentially. Uh, that's useful for a number of reasons, which I hope will become clear later on. Um, yeah, does, does anybody have questions with this? Anything I can explain better? All right, next slide. Okay, so if we're going to choose a particular encoding scheme, we, one thing we wanna do is minimize the total length, right? So if you had chosen like a super inefficient coding scheme, you might like, you might represent the letter A as the binary word 01000011100. You know, that's something that you could do, but would you want to do that? Probably not, because you're going to have this huge message, a huge encoded message, when you're, uh, when your original data was like actually smaller than that. So one thing we wanna do is to basically just minimize the total length of our encoded message. That's a good thing to do. And one strategy to accomplish that goal is we take the most frequently occurring segments of data. So a segment of data would be, if you're looking at the English if you're looking at like a book, I'm gonna use the word word, but here I mean an English word, okay? <laughs> so we would take a word from that book and if that word occurs frequently, like the is a word that occurs very frequently, we might want to uh, encode that in a very small code word, okay? So, Using the binary alphabet, uh, a way of accomplishing this is if, if your thing occurs with like a probability of one half, like let's say you're looking at a book that where half of the words in the book is the. Probably not a super interesting book, but <laughs> if you were looking at a book like that, then it would make sense to take that word the and then put it into a code word that is one bit long. Um, and basically, this is how we're going to choose the length of the code word or the number of bits in the code word for each uh, segment of our data set. We'll take one over the probability of that segment of the data set occurring we'll take the log base two of that, and then we know how many bits we would like to use to represent this, uh, this segment of the data set. Um, yeah, so basically, if you look at the log base two, one over probability, if the probability is close to one, right, log base two, is going to be close to zero, right? What does that mean? If the probability of something occurring is close to one, that means that your original data is nothing but that. So 
when you take the log base 2 of that, the optimal length of bits to encode your message in becomes zero, you know? That makes sense because if, if your message is just uh, like a bunch of Ks, K, 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 forever, then there's really no message to send, you know? You know it's a K, the receiver knows that it's a K, so it's just like no message to send, no encoding. But if we have the one half again, if, if you have two things, each occurring with a probability of one half, then the number of bits that we want to store each of these things in is one, right? So we can encode one with a one, we can code the other one with a zero, and then we can send our message in an efficient way. Uh, and it's so on and so forth, you know? Let's say you have three things, one occurs with a probability of one half, one with one fourth, and the other one would be then one fourth. Well, what you want to do is the one that occurs with the probability of one half, you put it in one bit. So let's say you choose zero for that. The one that occurs with a probability of one fourth, well, you can actually do a little better here, right? One fourth, it tells you that you should store it in two bits, but you still have one left over, so you can put that and store it in one bit. And then the last one that occurs with the probability of one fourth, you're forced to store it in two bits. And that's like, you know, the maximum that you want to do. Um, all right. So that was good, but we can do even better than that. What I had written before was just the, uh, the broad statistics of your data set. So the probability of anything occurring. But we also have something called conditional probabilities. So what this is, is like, mm, if you have a book and it's like the cat, like those two words occur and you have a third word here, right? The cat, do you think, uh, orange. The cat orange. Does that make sense to you guys? Did, is that like a logical, or does that like, is that something, a sentence you'd, ex structure you'd expect to see? The cat orange. No, I've never seen a sentence like that. But something that you might see is the cat jumped. Right? That's, that's more reasonable. Right? So the conditional probability of the next word in the sequence being jumped is higher than the conditional probability than the next word being orange. Right? And these conditional probabilities are based on the, the words that came before. Okay? That's what I mean by conditional probability. So if, if our encoding and our decoding machines have a certain amount of memory, they can look at the previous words and they can encode and decode based off these conditional probabilities. So you can see in this formula, all I've done uh, to encode the number of bits is I'm using those conditional probabilities instead of just the gross broad statistical probabilities. And this ends up being even more efficient than this. Um, so yeah, any questions with that? Yeah. So this is, a, a problem is 
if you're just looking at your data set, right, to find these probabilities, you have to first calculate the probabilities. And there should be some internal statistics in your data set, which you could calculate them from. Um, so that's one way of getting these conditional probabilities. And the other way of getting them would be trying to estimate uh, like the, just generally like what it, what these conditional probabilities are for English. So I'm not sure if I helped answer your question. Could you uh, give me some feedback there? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, basically, first you have to get the probabilities. And after you get the probabilities, no matter like what method you use to get them, then you can figure out how many bits you want to encode each each thing in. Yeah. Okay. Uh, moving on to the next thing. So some important points. Shannon proved that the the even better strategy is optimal when the data set is produced by an ergodic stationary process. Don't really worry about what that means. I'm including this in here um, because it is important, but it's also kind of complex. I'll try to give you a broad idea though. Stationary means that there is some kind of probability distribution, some fixed probability distribution that is generating your data. Ergodic means that you can estimate the means of that distribution by looking at a large enough data set, essentially. Um, so yeah, then in this even better efficient uh, encoding scheme, the optimal number of bits in which to encode each data segment is depending on two things. It depends on the size of that memory in your encoding and decoding machines. And it's also depending on the distribution of your data set. So it's kind of difficult to like separate this idea from those two things. Um, and then we have this idea of entropy. So while that information of each, of each segment of your data set can be defined in terms of that segment's own probability, what information is, is it's a quality of the entire data set itself. Uh, basically, what it is, is it's the expected number of bits in a word when using this optimal encoding scheme. So this log base two of one over P of X sub I, that is the number of bits you want to use in the word representing the representing x sub i. If we take this times the probability of each thing and we sum them all together, we get the expected length of, uh, of these words. So what's down here is just the, uh, what it looks like for that even better, um, the, for the even better encoding. But we're just going to look at this for now because it's easier to understand. So this H function has some really great properties, which makes it a good measure of the uncertainty in your data set. The first one is that H is maximized when the probability distribution is uniform over all xi. Okay, so what do I mean by that? I would like to draw in three dimensions, actually. <laughs> let's say that's the third dimension. Then you have, let's say your data set contains two things, uh, x sub 1 and x sub 2. And then you're going to have 
probabilities. So the probability of x sub 1 is going to be 1 minus the probability of x sub 2 because we only have two things. Their probabilities have to add up to 1. So if we look in this plane, we're just going to have a line like that, 1, 1, on which these things live. H, this, this vertical axis is representing H. Now, if we were going to graph this H function, it would look like this, OK? So it's going to be maximized where these two things are, where the probabilities are equal at 1 half, 1 half. Uh, if the probability of one of them is 1, the probability of the other one is 0, there is no uncertainty about what is in our data set, then h is going to be 0. Um, and there was a third thing. Oh, yeah. The third thing that's really great about this h function, which you can read about in this paper, is that if you have, let's say you have three things, okay? You have x1, x2, and x3. And you're like, okay, these each have their own probabilities. px1, px2, and px3. Let's say you just want to look at x1 and not x1. So you're going to group x2 and x3 together into the same thing. Uh, I'll call that uh, x4. How does that sound to you guys? Or should I call it x23? x23 makes more sense. I'll go with that. So let's say we're going to group 2 and 3 together into the same thing. So then we'll just have p of 1 and p of x, 2, 3, right? If we calculate the entropy here, that's going to be exactly the same as the entropy here. So those three qualities, maximizing uh, when these things are uniformly distributed, being 0 when we are completely certain of what's in our data set, and also breaking up in this nice way makes H an extremely good measure of the uncertainty contained in our data set. Um, and it's called entropy uh, for historical reasons. It's called entropy because while Claude Shannon applied this formula to information and data, the first place it appeared was actually in thermodynamics like 100 years earlier. So it's just a cool part of history. And that's also why it's represented by an H because, I don't know, Germans use H for energy or something? Or H for, H for something. It has something to do with German, and my German is terrible, so. I don't really know. Uh, so yeah, now we know about encodings and data sets. I'm going to talk about the channel now. So the channel is the medium which you pass your message through after encoding it. There's this thing called the channel capacity, and that's the rate at which you can send messages through. Right, So that rate is going to be in terms of how many letters per second you can send through. Um, and the way that we would calculate that is we would take the number of unique messages that we can pass through in t seconds, take the logarithm of that. So just like with uh, the combinatorial thing, 
the number of messages that we can pass through in t seconds increases exponentially, right? If we take the logarithm of that, that's going to become a linear function. And then time increases at a certain rate. That ratio between those slopes, that's going to be C, our channel capacity. Uh, the reason why that limit, that limit is there is because if we're sending letters, right, and it takes like one second to send each letter, this actually is not going to be a smooth logarithm. It's going to, I mean, a sp smooth exponential function. It's going to increase like this in a step function, something like that. So then when we transform it, this is going to be another step function. And taking that limit just lets us estimate, you know, if it were actually linear, like what this would, what this would be, that ratio. Okay. So now you know about the information contained in a piece of data. You know about entropy, and you know about channel capacity. The way, this is just a sketch of the proof that Shannon used to show that that sort of encoding, the even better encoding, is optimal. Um, let's see. So the first thing he did was for an ergodic stationary distribution, he showed that as we increase the amount of memory, the entropy and the information calculated from our data set converges to a form of entropy and information calculated from the stationary distribution. Then, um, then he basically showed that the maximum rate at which words can be transmitted uh, is C over H. Okay, so C is in bits per second. H is in bits per word. It's the expected number of bits per word, right? So C over H gives you the maximum rate at which you can transmit words. Okay. Yeah, I'm still working on that personally. Um, but do we have do we have any questions about all that stuff? Yeah, go ahead. C over H is the maximum rate at which we can transmit information, basically, over a channel. Uh, so the efficiency depends on the, in, the particular encoding that you're using. C over H says that the most efficient code cannot transmit information faster than that. Yeah, like if you are looking at four, like if one word is of length four and the other one is of length one or something like that. I'm pretty sure that usually what people do is they uh, like, they will have like some kind of symbol that goes in between. So in reality, it's like even slower than that. But I, I'm not, I'm not exactly certain. There might be clever things that people do to solve that problem. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just not too sure. I've just been learning about this lately, so I'm not an expert here. Um, but anyways, yeah, that's the basic idea of information theory and the sort of framework in which Shannon came up with the, these ideas. And the rest of this talk, we're just going to be talking about cool places in other fields where the idea of information comes up and in which 
that way of looking at the world can help you understand like pretty much, well, not pretty much anything, but a lot of really cool things. Okay. So I'm going to hand this over to Varun. So this is like one of the applications that honestly, so I learned about this talent and it just popped up in my top bio class, which is super cool. Is anyone in 427 right now? Just random. Yeah. Anyway, um, so the here's, I'll set up the problem and then I'll show how information theory is used to not necessarily like, well, the solution is a little more complex, like to this quote unquote problem. Some could argue that it's not fully solved yet, but information theory gives you really good insights onto like how to almost solve this problem that I'm going to set up and discover these uh, special sites in the genome. So the idea is that you have genes that code for certain proteins that maybe if you were to be missing something, you could have like some kind of like nucleotide uh, morph or like a mutation in a gene, maybe that might screw you up or give you an extra limb or something like that, right? So we want to study that, like why do certain like changes in the genome result in disease? Uh, what what changes won't result in disease? Why is it that some people can have a lot of mutations and be perfectly healthy, but you can have one mutation in the wrong spot, and then all of a sudden you have uh, an incurable like terminal illness? So that's obviously a very important thing to study. Um, it's a lot more complicated than just this region of the genome codes for this protein, which we'll then have to balance in a sec. Uh, a large part of how our bodies work in general, how like differentiation happens between different cells, is this idea of transcription factors. So essentially you will have like sections of the genome that do in fact, when uh, transcribed and then translated into amino acids, do end up being proteins. However, there are sections near-ish to those main gene regions um, called like the, basically they're just like binding sites for other proteins or transcription factors that make it such that these genes can be expressed, right? So this is almost like there's an interplay between these two sections of the genome and to understand fully how certain like mutations will affect disease outcomes, we need to understand how these two parts work together, okay? So there is a gene that goes for a protein and there are sections somewhere near that gene that other proteins that already exist will bind to and then affect its expression. So a mutation here could have an effect. And maybe a mutation here could have an effect. Maybe if there's a mutation here and here, there could be an interesting effect. We don't know, right? But we need to study them. Uh, a large part of doing that is finding these sites, right? So like there could be different genes, but the binding sites could have a very, very common motif, right? So if we locate that motif among like seven or eight different like genes, there is the same sequence of letters that appears over and over and over again, and we'll notice like, oh, there's a mutation in that, then all of a sudden this protein stops being expressed, and this person cannot process this anymore, they get, they get a disease of some kind, then we know that that area of the genome is incredibly important for that disease. So what I'm trying to get at is finding these binding sites for transcription factors is really important. And doing so helps understand disease a little better. So, and there's a problem though. Things are just not that simple. Um, there's a lot of, uh, I guess, degeneracy or noise in the recognition code. There are important sections of those motifs that I'm talking about, these letters that are not blue. Um, they will relatively be consistent on there, the important ones. But there are also sections of that motif that can be variable with no effect to the binding affinity of the transcription factor. Meaning that there is a segment that is somewhat noisy, but is incredibly important for the expression of some kind of proteins. And like, I guess the like the physical reason for that is like here, the contacting bases of like some protein transcription factor are not consecutive, right? So we don't fully know what they look like. There's no one motif that exists among all of these genes, right? But we want to find those regions regardless. So the idea is, how do we locate the positions on the genome that are important for binding affinity? And how do we know that another region isn't actually important for binding affinity? We can't just do like a brute force search because then what we need to do is have a bunch of permutations of this kind of type, 
run through them all, and that might just take, well, much too long, right? How do we somehow calculate it in a more intelligent way? So uh, the first thing that you would do, essentially, is there's there's uh, some, I guess, quote unquote pre work in, in this field, as I'm sure there's some other um, like tests you could run, to kind of um, subset, like, oh, here we don't know exactly what the motif looks like, but at least we know it doesn't look like this, or it might somewhat look like this. And you'd get a bunch of basically like, uh, like a subset of possible motifs. This is this is like really tiny, it's bigger than this, right? And then from that you can calculate statistics, right? Like oh, at position one of this motif, I tend to see uh, G really frequently. At position two, you know, I'll tend to see tend to see like doesn't really match up, does it? But you'll see like a different letter, right? Uh, a lot more frequently. So the idea is you can create this table of uh, probabilities. Um, that can tell you, like, here is generally what the motif will look like, right? You can do a greedy selection. So you select the most, like, you know, probable um, base pair at each position. But then again, like I said, uh, these transcription factor binding sites are somewhat variable. So what you don't know, like, is position two the one that could, you know, have a little more variability in it? Um, is, is it, like, position four? Well, you can look and say, like, oh, hey, you know, G tends to show up a lot. Maybe that means that G here is like pretty consistent and over in like, you know, where the probabilities are a little more even over maybe like two is like some a little more even than the other ones. Uh, there can be a little more variability, right? But how do we quantify that? How do we know that, say for example, in position two, if we have this even of a distribution, then that is a site at which the base pair is variable. Right? Like, you could arbitrarily just say, oh, if it shows up at 90% of the time, uh, then that is a fixed, strong position, like the black letters over here. Those are ones that are important. And if there's a relatively even distribution, then it's a blue letter, something like here, right? But we want to be, obviously, a little more statistically strong about that. So this is where information theory comes in. We can actually compare two different uh, distributions, basically. We can use the entropy equation essentially to quantify how important a position is um, in determining like the motif, basically, right? So we will have um, right here, this yi is basically the importance of that position. This h of x is going to be, given the distribution of one like position across the motif, the entropy of that like distribution, Right? So we can calculate that. And then this information content total is a fancy way of saying what is the expected distribution in this content. So we can essentially compare and say like, okay, here is what we expect to see based on the background distribution of A, T, C, and G um, inside this section of the genome. Right? And here is the distribution that we observe. We can compare the two and see how surprising this distribution Right, and well, information theory is just is just the way to do that. This is how we came up with a solution. So this this is the I'll walk through this. It's actually not that not that much. Say the background distribution is that A, T, C, and G are all even. That's what this means. They're all 0.25. If we calculate the entropy, in this case, I just changed the symbol to information content subtotal, which is just what they notated it as. Um, this is just how you calculate that, and you get two. Basically, that is what quantifies is like the amount of entropy inside that distribution. That is going to be the maximum because as we, as uh, Helen stated before, when the probabilities are completely even, that is when the entropy is maximized, right? So now we want to check. Say we have a distribution that has A showing up with a probability of 85%. Now let's say, just we know, that's very, 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 like, solid, like A always exists in that section of the motif, right? How do we identify that? Well, we can calculate the entropy of this distribution, subtract it from the maximum entropy, and we'll get this number right here. That, it tells you how important that position is um, for, like, for this motif. And here I've done, I've created a more even distribution, and you can see its importance is minuscule, right? 
So by using information theory, you can basically now create a mapping of like position one and two are incredibly important because they you know scale way above the others. But position three and position seven, they can be variable. And then when you study these motifs, you can note that single like nucleotide polymorphisms at certain points can be disregarded and oh, these are not important. But a, a morphism at like another point is really important, and that can you know, it really screw someone up if there is actually mutation at that point. So that's like one application of information theory that I thought was like incredibly important. And this problem isn't actually technically unique to biology. You can see how you can just check the surprise of a distribution using this method, right? And even though it seems somewhat intuitive, it is rooted in this in information theory, which is what makes this paper so interesting. So pretty much all I have for the compound assessment. All right. So now we have machine learning applications. And information theory is very interesting for, or very important for machine learning because information theory is very important for statistics. Uh, one place where these show up that you guys might have seen before is in loss functions. Two extremely popular loss functions, cross entropy and KL divergence. Uh, let me show what you got, what these things are. So cross entropy, that looks a lot like just the regular entropy, doesn't it? Like if P, if you had some probability distribution P, this cross entropy formula looks a lot like H equals some piece of I uh, log one over piece of I. The only difference is for cross entropy, there's a Q here instead of a P. What that Q represents is a different distribution than P, okay? So when we are doing machine learning, our model has some kind of assumed distribution over the world, right? Whatever task it's supposed to be doing, it kind of assumes that the data is distributed in some way. It has its own, what I'll call a prior distribution. Uh, that would be Q sub i, or just Q, really. And then P would be the distribution of the actual data. What cross entropy allows us to do is compare those two distributions, Q and P. So that will tell us, basically, how close Q is to P. And the reason why this works is because uh, for any for any Q and for any P, we have, well, I'll just write it like this, actually. We have cross entropy is greater than or equal to just the regular entropy. That's for any distribution P and any distribution Q. And we also have H is equal to C, E, to the cross entropy, if and only if these distributions are equal. If and only if P and Q are equal. So the cross entropy, or yeah, the cross entropy of your prior with the true distribution of the data is only going to be equal to the entropy of the data if you know the distribution perfectly. Uh, if you don't know it perfectly, if your prior is a little off, then your cross entropy is going to be bigger than the entropy of that data. Okay? KL divergence is a related idea. Basically, to get KL divergence, all you do is cross entropy minus entropy. Okay? Uh, based off of that earlier inequality, this is going to be greater than or equal to zero. And it will only equal zero when 
Q and P are equal. So if you are totally right about everything, uh, CE minus H, the KL divergence is going to be zero. If you're a little bit wrong, it's going to be something bigger than zero. And that is a loss function that we can minimize, right? Uh, Varun, did you have some input on why these are? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So, pro well, oh yeah, hold on. You want to just realize it? What? I didn't have your mic for my whole section. Oh, shit. <laughs> I'll take it out on you for a second. Yeah. Yeah, so um, just two quick things is one, cross entropy is basically like the standard loss function for classification in deep learning. So, I mean, information theory has had its impact even in like, you know, modern algorithms and like networks today, which is super cool. So like if you're, you know, creating a classification network, you're going to use cross entropy. That's like just the basic pick as standard. So that's where that comes up. Um, KL divergence, who here was attended the variational autoencoders lecture that I did a little bit ago. Yeah, so you may see, it may recognize KL divergence. It's how you compare how separate, like, the distribution that came out of the encoder of your autoencoder is from, you know, the standard normal distribution, which was useful for getting that um, global smoothness that we talked about earlier. Essentially, this comes up um, in some like early work when it comes to gener like generative networks um, and also with like again autoencoders are a way to compress data so again more information theory for you there so yeah they're, they're just like I wouldn't say they're like like used like oh everywhere but like they're important equations that show up like pretty often in, in deep learning so yeah that's why they're useful okay, cool. okay. alright so now we come to mutual information, and this is my probably my favorite concept in uh, information theory so far. Uh, but when I was first learning like probability, I was extremely disappointed in the definition of like correlation, the correlation coefficients. And the reason why I was disappointed was because correlation coefficients only measure linear relationships. So it's called correlation, right? But if you have, a, let's say you have data that looks like, like that, right? There's obviously an interesting correlation there, but that correlation will not be captured by correlation coefficients. Because even though there's an interesting relationship, it's not a linear relationship. Mutual information catches basically any sort of correlation between two random variables. Um, the way that it's calculated is basically, oh, there shouldn't be a comma here. That's the typo. Basically, you calculate the KL divergence between the joint distribution and the product of the distributions. And what do we know? So P of X, Y, the joint, the joint distribution is going to be equal to the product distribution if and only if the random variables X and Y are independent, right? So if these two things are equal, X and Y are independent, and also based off of what we know about cross entropy, um, this mutual information is going to be zero, okay? Now, if there's any sort of relationship, any sort of correlation between X and Y, then this equation will not hold, which means this will be greater than zero. So basically, mutual information allows us to find any relationship, not just a linear one. And, you know, it kind of like, I'm not going to say it fixes the correlation coefficient, but I was super disappointed by correlation coefficient. So I like mutual information. Uh, it does have a problem, though, in that it's extremely difficult to estimate.
But I just think it's cool. <laughs> okay, so those are some basic ideas that have kind of permeated machine learning. Let me tell you guys about a uh, modern day sort of a modern day theory about machine learning that is completely founded in information theory. Uh, and this is something based on what's called the information bottleneck method. Some people even call it the information bottleneck theory. But basic idea is that learning from a data set amounts to finding a really good form of lossy compression. What do I mean by that? So your data set, let's say it's a bunch of images of people, and you want to be able to identify like who's in who's in the image, right? I don't know. Let's say it's images of your like, some of them are images of your mom, some of them are images of your dad, right? You just want to be able to figure out which which person is in that image or if they're both in there. Well, the images are going to contain a lot of irrelevant information, like the background, what they're wearing. Um, <laughs> basically, there's a bunch of irrelevant information. And if we find a way to compress this data where we lose the irrelevant information, keep the relevant information by encoding these data points into a code where if your dad is in the image, it's one code word, and if your mom is in the image, it's the other code word, then we, we basically learn how to recognize our mom and dad. So that, that's the idea that this information bottleneck method is based on. Um, and what people are saying, some people, others disagree, but it's that by controlling that level of compression that happens in a neural network, you can control the generalization error of your neural network. Uh, so basically, they're, they've found ways to modulate the level of compression that happens as you go from layer to layer. And some people are calculating that this very directly lets us control how well this, uh, how well our network generalizes to unseen data points. Uh, like I was saying before, this is kind of a controversial thing, but that doesn't mean that it's absolute BS. It has a lot of very reputable people who, you know, support it. And in particular, if you're curious about this idea, I would recommend reading this article. It is very, very recent, and it's written by Yan LeCun. So, you know, a guy who really knows what he's talking about. All about this information bottleneck method. Okay. Neuroscience applications. Uh, as far as I know, there's basically two ways that information gets theory gets applied to neuroscience. The first way is people calculating mutual information between neurons, and that kind of helps them understand the information flow through the brain. Uh, the other way is looking at how brains represent information internally. What I mean by that is looking at the codes that your brain uses to represent like sensory data, for example. Um, and people think that, first of all, these codes are efficient, you know, a hallmark of information theory. They're predictive, uh, which is, in a lot of ways, the same thing as efficient. If you remember when we were looking at the good and even better encodings, the even better encoding was even better because it was predictive. So efficiency and predictiveness kind of go hand in hand. Uh, and they're error correction, error correcting. And this isn't really something that I talked about, but basically, if you have a nice, smooth channel, you can just send your data over in that most efficient encoding that we talked about before. If your channel has a bunch of noise and it screws up the message that's coming through it, you have to add more uh, 
basically more information, more like redundancy into your code in order to ensure that even if it gets received with errors, you can still decode it and get the original message. So these are all basically foundational ideas in information theory, and they're used to analyze neural codes. Uh, so I'll just talk about some of my favorite codes. The grid code. The grid code is about how your brain represents space, okay? You basically have these cells in your brain. You have a bunch of them. They're called grid cells. And when you're walking around, and if you were to look at the activation of one grid cell, you're like walking around, and suppose there's like a hexagonal grid here. Here it's actually squares. It, it's really hexagonal, but imagine for a second that's a square grid. You're looking at this one grid cell. If I step on this square, then that grid cell is going to pop off in my brain. If I step off of this square, it's going to turn off. But because we're looking at a grid, it's going to pop on when I step on another part of the grid. Uh, I don't know if that explanation made much sense to you guys, so we have this diagram here. What this shows is this rat walks around, and this grid cell that we're looking at has this intrinsic grid that it obeys. So whenever the rat walks onto one of these vertexes here, this blue, these blue dots is the activity of its neuron. Um, so, yeah, that's basically grid cells. Now, a single grid cell doesn't tell you much because it'll just tell you like where you are in space mod something. But if you get a bunch of grid cells together of the same scale, you overlay them all over each other, you can get a finer resolution of where you are. And then if you compare these grid cells, uh, where they're telling us you are, if you, if you do that for a bunch of different scales, you can kind of, uh, do you guys know about, about like prime numbers? So, let's say you're looking at things that occur like every two, uh, every two units. So this would be a two, four, six, and this would be an eight. And you're looking at another thing that occurs every three units. So this is another one. Uh, that's still just a six. Okay, so let's say you have one set of grid cells that have a scale of three, another one that has a scale of two. Right? When you combine the information from both of these together, instead of just being able to figure out where you are within a, within a square of size three, you'd be able to figure out where you are within a square of size six, because there would be no repetition of that combination within that, uh, within a grid of that size. Uh, it's a very interesting idea. And this particular way, of representing space creates a high capacity and error correcting code. Um, if you guys want to read more about that, I highly recommend this paper. Um, yeah, it's just very cool. So basically what we're doing there is we're using the ideas from information theory to analyze how your brain stores information and figuring out why it does it that way, why it's why that's good. Uh, the last thing I'm going to talk about, well, not the last thing, but second to last thing, is the vision code. And honestly, I don't know nearly enough about this one. So, oh. I'm not exactly sure. I know that we also have something called like mirror cells, right? Like mirror neurons, and that is definitely involved in that. I'm, grid cells, they very well could be, because 
grid cells are not just implicated in like location, they're implicated in memory, in uh, in like in memory, in learning, in navigation. You know, they're they're these really important cells, basically. And the whole navigation system in your brain is more complicated than just grid cells. It's definitely a very interesting rabbit hole to go down if you uh, are inclined. Uh, so the vision code, basically with our, our eyes, right? They're these two dimensional surfaces and they have to capture that spatial information in those two dimensions. They also have to capture time information in those two dimensions, right? Um, the way that they capture that information is very interesting. So when they're capturing spatial information, they don't just look at, okay, this neuron is receiving red, this is receiving green, and so on and so forth. Instead, what they do is they basically take the second derivative uh, of all that information, and then they pass that derivative information through back into your brain. And then that derivative information reconstructs the original image. Uh, this whole idea intersects with information theory uh, in two ways. One is just like the calculation of this stuff, but also because before when we had talked about information theory, we were talking about it in terms of a sequential ordered data set. When you have two dimensions, it's not so clear. And basically, people have been trying to generalize information to two dimensions. And the exact way in which they've found that works is if you take that derivative information. Somehow, it's like if we want to generalize the idea of information, we kind of have to do the same thing that our eyes are doing to light signals. Uh, yeah. I don't know too much about it, but it's definitely something quite curious and interesting. The other thing, the other sort of connection here is a certain type of optical illusion. So this is for efficient encoding of time data. Have you guys ever stared at like uh, a dot on a wall and you, you like stare at it for like a minute and then when you look away, that dot is still stuck in your vision. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? Yeah, so that is an example of an optical illusion and you might wonder, why does that happen, right? Well, if that dot has been there for long enough, you're, first of all, there's two things. Your eyes get tired of seeing it, so they sort of become, they run out of gas, so they can't transmit information really anymore. And your brain just assumes that that dot stayed there. Um, this is really analogous to how MP4 encodings work for video. Uh, the way that MP4s work is you have an image and you only update that image on the next frame where it has changed. Okay, so your brain is, if it's seeing the same thing, it just decides to shut off and stop updating that. And it's the same thing with MP4s. If the same thing happens in two like adjacent images, no update happens. Um, so yeah, I just thought that was a very cool connection there. Um, yeah, I don't know too much about vision, but there's definitely a lot going on there. Uh, so yeah, like I said before, me and Varun, we've been looking at this whole information theory thing and our plan is to apply it towards natural language processing. Uh, we're gonna keep studying this stuff, uh, trying to use information theory to build the better machine learning models. And me personally, I wanna understand some of the mathematics of like generalizing to non-ergodic sources. And yeah, after that, we're going to save the world. So if you guys are interested in this stuff, we would love to have you join us. Um, we're basically just going to be 
playing around with these ideas and doing research and stuff. So, yeah, that's the end. Okay. Any like closing questions or anything? All right. Oh. So I think that this paper was published in 48. Uh, and I don't know how much memory was available, but it was pretty small, right? Yeah, nothing compared to what we have now. Yeah? OK. Hey, thanks for showing up, guys. And it's been a long talk. Thanks for sticking with it. I hope you guys found this like to be a pretty interesting topic and I hope it kind of inspires you in the future and like your interests and stuff. <laughs>